Uh, Malcolm grew, uh, was born in England, grew up in Canada, and he graduated from the University of Toronto with a history degree. From the late 1980s to the uh, mid-1990s, he worked for the Washington Post, and today he is a staff writer for the New Yorker magazine. He is working on a second book, which should be out in about a year, and he's going to talk about that a little bit. I hope you will join me in welcoming Malcolm Gladwell. Thank you very much for that very generous introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I, you know, I've only ever uh, been to, uh, I've never been to Pensacola before, in fact. The only places in Florida I've ever been were um, Disney World, is it Disney World? And South Beach. So <laughs> my, uh, my sense of Florida was a place where you were either dressed up in a, in a, in a mouse suit or you were dressed up in almost nothing at all. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy to discover, in fact, there are people such as yourself who dress very nicely. Um, <laughs> so it's a big relief uh, to be here. And my, uh, my opinion of Florida has been permanently, um, I think, um, uh, uh, rescued um, by this experience. But I, um, uh, I gather some of you are, are familiar with my old book, Tipping Point. Um, and it just occurs to me that I could have talked about that and could still. Or I can talk about my next book, and maybe that's more exciting. Um, um, the, uh, I haven't really talked about my new book to any audience before, so um, you guys are in, the, you're in the vanguard. I don't know whether this is going to be a treat or a, um, I'll discover that, in fact, the whole thing was one big mistake. Um, <laughs> but I'll try and judge from, gauge this from your reaction. Um, the book I'm writing, on, I'm writing now is um, it's a book about uh, first impressions and snap judgments and things like that. And um, it's, uh, it's, the basic idea is w to ask the question, what would happen if we took the unconscious seriously? That is to say, what would happen if we tried to structure our world um, uh, in a way that, uh, that paid particular attention and, like I said, took seriously, gut feelings and intuitions and the things that bubble up to the surface without we really knowing uh, where they come from? Um, now, obviously, that's a really, I think it's a really interesting topic. And there's a million different directions you can go in that, with that. And I, I have chapters on what it means to make decisions if you're fighting a war and, you know, under extreme pressure. I have a chapter on police officers when they make the decision of whether to shoot or not, um, which, again, is like a really interesting, do you, you know, do you go with your gut? What happens when your gut is wrong? You know, why is your gut wrong? All these kinds of things. Um, I have long discussions of what it means to return a tennis serve, which if anyone is a tennis fan, um, I'd be happy to talk about it. But for those of you who aren't, I won't bore you with that at the moment. Um, but the one I want to talk about today is, um, oh, I forgot, major chapters on dating, of course. <laughs> I mean, what could be more interesting? Um, and uh, marriage um, and other similar things. Um, but the one I want to talk to you about today is a, is a chapter that um, – is uh, it's really about market research, although it, that, to say that it's about market research makes it sound, uh, I think, more boring than it actually is. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a chapter where I ask a really, I think, kind of simple question, but a question that I don't think we ask enough, which is, um, if I ask you why you think what you think, can I trust your answer? That is to say, are we very good at describing the reasons why we hold the opinions that we do? Um, now, I got interested in this question um, about six months ago, because I met this guy named Kenna. I don't suppose many of you will have heard of Kenna, unless the only people who would have heard of Kevin, Kenna are if any of you have um, a very, very, very cool teenager between the ages of, say, 14 and 17. They may know who Kenna is. Kenna is this guy who's this incredibly handsome, tall, um, charismatic young man. Uh, he was born in Ethiopia, and he grew up in Virginia Beach. And um, a couple years ago, he's a musician wanted to be a musician. So he recorded a couple of songs, and he made his own little demo CD. Um, now, one of the things that makes Kenna really interesting is his music is really interesting. It's very, very unusual. You haven't heard music like this before, um, and we'll come back to the significance of that in a moment. But um, the, uh, someone I know who was a big fan of Kenna said that his music is what happens when you mix the kind of 
British New Wave music of the 80s with rap. Now, if you could, I don't know if you can imagine that, but I really can't and couldn't until I heard what Kenna's music's like. Anyway, it's a little weird. So Kenna makes this CD, and he, you know, he's just some random guy living in Virginia Beach. Through a long series of coincidences, it falls into the hands of an A&R guy, a scout, for a very big record label in New York. And the scout takes the CD to the head of Atlantic Records, one of the big record labels. This guy who gets 150 demos a week, right, and just pops them in. And 99% of the time, they're out of his CD player after the first 15 seconds. He knows what crap is. And, you know. He listens to Ken and he's like, whoa, this is really good. Gets on the phone with Ken and he says, come to New York now. I want to meet you. Kenna flies in and he's just, the two of them sit in his office and this guy's, and Kenna sings his songs from right there and it's just, his head is like going around and around and around and around. He's like, this guy is something special. So at the same time, Kenna's music, this little CD, falls into the hands of a guy who works for, as a, as a producer for a man named Fred Durst. Again, your kids will know who Fred Durst is. Fred Durst is the lead singer for a band called Limp Bizkit. He's a very, very big deal. Um, this producer hears this music he calls up Fred Durst on his cell phone, and he literally puts the cell, cell phone next to the speaker of the CD player and says, you've got to hear this. He plays Fred Durst like 30 seconds, and Fred Durst said, where is this guy? Bring him to LA. I want to sign him for my record label. They fly him in. People are going crazy about Kenna. He runs, randomly runs into the manager of U2, world's biggest rock band. The manager of U2 flies him to Ireland to discuss like their future together and all kinds of things they're going to do. Kenna, at this point, he's just, again, a random guy. He goes to New York. He goes to MTV. No, there's two MTV channels, MTV1, the one, the normal one. Then it's MTV2, which is the kind of specialty one, right, which is the really hardcore music one. Companies spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to get their music played on MTV2. And if you can get it played 100 times on MTV2, your, your video, you're the happiest company in the world. Kenna walks over to MTV2, where he knows no one, says, I have this CD. I think you guys should play it. And by the way, I made my home, this little home video for my music. And he gives them the, you know, the cassette. They sort of randomly plug it in. They're like, whoa. They play it 475 times <laughs> from this guy who walked in off the street. And it's, he's, so Ken is becoming, Ken has never performed live. And some, so somebody calls him up and says, who saw him, this little video, and says, you know, someone called from the Roxy, which is this really cool club in LA and says, we've had a cancellation. I hear you're in California. Do you want to play tonight at the Bronx? Kenneth's never played before. Kenneth puts a little notice on his website at 4.30 that afternoon saying, by the way, I'm playing at the Roxy tonight. He sells out the Roxy. People are hanging from the rafters. Right? <laughs> He's just this incredible phenomenon. Anyway, so this is, this is where it gets really interesting. In order to get music played on the radio, you have to put it through a process of market testing. And the way they market test research, music is they do what's called call-out research. And it's done with a very, very strict, elaborate formu formula. You take a little clip of a song, and you call up a random selection of people who listen to your radio station, and you play them you know, 15 or 20 seconds of it. And then you say, what did you think of that song? Do you want to hear it again? Are there parts that you liked? And then you go and you do it a little more rigorously, and you send it out. People listen to the whole song in its entirety, and they email back, or they write back their responses, or you call them up on the phone. This is done for absolutely every song that makes it on the radio. You don't get on the radio unless you do very well on, your, on, your, um, on what you, what's called your call-out. Um, so Kenna, the first thing these people do who are really, really interested in Kenna is they said, well, let's market research it, because I'm not going to sign this guy to a million dollar contract. Obviously, if the radio stations aren't going to play it, and radio stations only play music that does well on call-out. So they think, well, it's not going to be a problem. This kid's amazing. So they go out and they do call-out research on Kenna. And here's what's happen what happens. Kenna does abysmally. In fact, he does so poorly on the call out, you know, they give you these scores. And if you're, you know, here, you're going to get played 10 times a day. And if you're in the middle, they'll play it a little bit. Kenna's down here. He's at the level where they take the CD and they flip it out the window, right? In fact, I'll give you a quote from one of these things, from one of the conclusions of one of these market research tests. Kenna as an artist and his songs lack a core audience and have limited potential to gain significant radio airplay. The radio guys are saying this man has no future. The hardcore people in the music industry are going crazy over him and their heads spinning round and round and round, right? But in the world of music, radio wins. 
So radio, so Kennett did not get a record deal, not from anyone, not from these people who thought he was the second coming of Prince. So here's the question, right? <laughs> Here we have two completely radically different predictions as to whether Kenna is going to make it in the world of music. Which one of them do we believe? Right? That's what the chapter is all about. Now, um, this question is obviously not limited to music, right? We live in a world where absolutely everything is market researched. Every move that politicians make, every thing you buy in the supermarket, every movie you see, you know, everything has gone through this identical ringer where you go out and you formally ask people to, to you have focus groups, you have questionnaires, you have all of these different techniques that are, that are done to gather information about what people think about your product and how should you change it in order to make it more acceptable to them, right? Now, what I want to argue is that um, this process is fundamentally flawed. It is completely screwed up. Um, we totally overrate the significance of what we find out when we go through this kind of formal process. And the consequence of that sort of over-reliance on this system is that we are cheating ourselves out of all kinds of wonderful experiences that we would otherwise have. We're cheating ourselves out of the Kenna, Kennas of the world. Um, so what I want to do now is to sort of describe to you why I think it's screwed up and what that means for people in this category of Kenna, who are these apparently brilliant artists who are walking around without a record deal. I think he's actually working for FedEx right now. But, um, possibly the most musically talented employee in FedEx history. Um, so let me start by telling you a story, a story that I'm sure you all know of in some way, but sort of retelling it in a little more specific way. And it's the story of um, the story of New Coke, right? The most famous product disaster in, in one of the most famous in American history. Um, now remember how, how this worked. Coca-Cola decided that they had to change their formula because of uh, they felt they were under extraordinary pressure from Pepsi. And um, the reason they were under such pressure from Pepsi, remember, is that Pepsi was running the Pepsi Challenge, right? They were going around the country and they were doing these taste tests. And they would give you, the way it worked was they would gather a panel of dedicated Coke drinkers and they would give you two glasses. One was, you know, M and one was Q. And they said, take a sip of both and tell us which one you prefer. And then you would say, why? I think M is way better. And then they would flip off the little labels, you know, the little uh, uh, pieces of paper, and you would, lo and behold, you had just drunk Pepsi. There you were, a dedicated Coke drinker, and you actually secretly preferred the, the opposition, right? Now, this Coke, the first thing Coke did when Pepsi started running these taste tests is they think, well, Pepsi must have, you know, this must be some sort of trick. So they did their own, very quietly went out and did their own taste tests. Same thing happened. <laughs> Pepsi was winning hands down, right? So um, you can imagine this is unbelievably devastating to the management of Coca-Cola, right? Here you've got this, the, one of the most powerful brands in America. It's been around forever. And what is the basis of Coca-Cola's sort of strength and genius and reputation? This wonderful secret formula, right, that produces this amazing drink. And they've had the confidence for years that they're making the best soft drink the world has ever known. And now they're going into the marketplace. And they didn't just do, by the way, when they did these taste tests to try and test to see what Pepsi were doing, they weren't doing 10 or 15 or 25. They were doing hundreds of thousands of tests, right? They're going into malls. They're spending millions and millions of dollars. They're not leaving anything to chance here. We're talking about a multi-billion dollar company. And the results came back over and over again that something like 57% of dedicated Coke drinkers preferred Pepsi in a blind taste test. Now, that, that doesn't sound like a big deal, but that seven... That's huge. That's your core audience, basically. So they panic, and they think, oh my goodness, we're like in trouble. This is the end of Coca-Cola. And if you read, so what they do is they, um, so they go back into the laboratory, and they produce a new version of Coke, one that they think is going to stand up much better to Pepsi. And, um, and what they did is they changed it so it was a little bit lighter and a little bit sweeter than Coke, so that much closer to the taste profile of Pepsi. And then they go out, and they do blind taste tests with this new Coke, right? And um, they do exactly the same test they did before. And now Pepsi, uh, Coke is not losing to Pepsi. The new Coke is beating Pepsi, right? And they do it not just once. They do it hundreds of thousands of times in every single city in the world until they are absolutely sure that this is a product that is superior in every way to the competition. And then they hold that famous press conference in Atlanta, and they stand up and they say, 
you know, we're changing Coke. We're coming out with new Coke, and this is going to be a world beater. And they said, someone actually asked them at the time, you know, how certain are you? Isn't this a big risk? And the guy, the CEO of Coke says, I have never been so certain of a decision in my life. And <laughs> why shouldn't he have been, right? They just spent, I don't know how many millions of dollars testing this with hundreds and thousands of people in every corner of the globe. And in every single test, they come back beating Pepsi, right? Now, of course, um, they were wrong, spectacularly wrong, right? New Coke was not a success. It was a disaster. No one liked it. Everyone hated it when it got into the market. And not only that, this kind of edge that Pepsi appeared to have had in the, ta in the taste test that was supposed to drive the old Coke out of to extinction never happened. Today, old Coke is still more popular than Pepsi, right? So they were wrong on every single count. They were fundamentally, they made a, f a fundamentally disastrous decision, right? Now, if you go to business school, you will study this story as a case study, and they will tell you all the reasons why Coke screwed up. And there's all kinds of things about the corporate culture and the business model and the this and the that and the other. What I want to say is there's a way simpler explanation of this. And the explanation is that the reason Coke screwed up is that taste tests are a really, really, really bad way of getting to the question of what people actually think of your drink. Right? They are fundamentally flawed. Now that sounds incredible. Right? How can that be true? What could be a pure way of me finding out what you think about my drink by having you test it in a blind taste test? Right? It seems like ridiculous that there should be something wrong with that. Um, but in fact, there is. There's all kinds of things wrong with that. Um, first of all, the first thing to understand about the Pepsi challenge is that um, I always find it mildly comic, by the way, that I end up, that here I am discussing the Pepsi challenge like it's some... Um, <laughs> Famous, you know, this is on a par with the great research experiments of the, you know. Um, anyway, um, it kind of is interesting. First of all, it's a sip test. Now, that's tremendously significant. When, the, when, they, when you sit down in the Pepsi challenge, they don't say drink the whole can. They say take a sip, right? Now, the beverage industry also has something they call the home use test. And what that is is they give you several cases of their beverage. You take it home and you drink it over the course of several weeks. And then you come back and give you your answer about what you think of this beverage. Now, the interesting thing is that you get fundamentally different answers from home use testing than you do from SIP testing. Why? Because SIP testing is biased in the favor of something sweet. You will always prefer something sweet if you just take a small sip. If you drink the whole can, then things that are very sweet start to become very cloying and unpleasant, right? So Pepsi is the sweeter cola, so the SIP test is is set up, is biased completely in favor of Pepsi. So that's problem number one, that they were, they basically, Pepsi built a product that was designed to shine not in the marketplace, but in a SIP test. Right? So now the question is, why doesn't Coke make this argument in 1984? Why don't they come out and just say, well, don't believe the SIP test because this is an artifact of the fact it's just a SIP. If you drink the whole can, you'll prefer Coke. Well, that's a very, very, very good question. They would have saved themselves a lot of trouble. Um, if they'd done that. But it is perhaps the reason is that it's actually very hard to say that to people because it sounds like you're being condescending, right? You don't really know what you think. Um, we know better. Drink the whole, you know, it sounds very like, you know, mother to son or mother to daughter. It's not a, it's not a, the kind of position that you want to be in if you're um, a consumer products company. In any case, they don't make that argument and they fail as a result. Um, okay. So let's go further. There's another flaw in, um, in the taste test. And it's based on something that, uh, that uh, is, is known as sensation transference. Now, sensation transference is something that's discovered by a guy named Louis Cheskin. And Louis Cheskin is um, he's part of, there's a whole wave of psychologists who, um, in the 1950s, many of whom actually are from Europe. In fact, many of them come from Vienna and are former students of either Freud or Freud's disciples. And they're obsessed with, um, uh, understanding the role of the unconscious in, um, in, um, uh, in, in marketing and market research. And I think these guys, I actually, I love these guys. I think they're all, um, in fact, in many ways, a good deal more sophisticated than marketers are today. Um, anyway, what Cheskin discovered, Cheskin's big thing was that when some people, when consumers gave an assessment of something they would buy in a supermarket, um, they would, without realizing it, transfer sensations or impressions that they had about the packaging onto the product itself. In other words, Cheskin's great insight is that consumers don't make a distinction on an unconscious level between the product and the package. 
The product is the package in a certain way. Now, he did all kinds of cool work um, with, um, with margarine. That's another example of a phrase I never thought I would hear myself say. Um, <laughs> margarine, and I doubt any of you are old enough to remember this. Um, none of you certainly look like you're old enough to remember this. Um, margarine at the very beginning, when it comes out of the Second World War, is a disaster, right? No, everyone hated margarine. Why did they hate margarine? Because they thought it tasted terrible. It didn't taste nearly as good as butter. And, he, and in the beginning as well, you remember margarine was white. It was not yellow. You couldn't make it yellow because the dairy farmers had some would pass special laws. That, anyway, so Cheskin came along and his ta he was told, he was hired by the margarine guys to save margarine. And everyone said, you know what, it's going to be impossible because the problem is it just doesn't taste good. You're never going to fix that. Cheskin said, no, 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 I can fix it. So here's what he does. First thing he does is he lobbies really hard and he gets the restriction against coloring it yellow lifted. So all of a sudden margarine's not white anymore, it's yellow. Second thing he does, he's working for imperial margarine at the time. Now, imperial margarine at the time Cheskin started is not called imperial. It's called like, you know, I don't know. Um, but one of the things he says to them is, first, you guys are going to call yourself imperial margarine, by the way, from now on. Because we're not selling some downscale product. We're selling something that I'm going to put a big crown on it because it's really high quality. And then he says, we're going to wrap it in foil. We're not going to wrap it in paper or whatever it was. And at the time, some sent today, but at the time, in the back in the 50s, foil was what you wrapped things that were really special in. You know, it was what you wrapped very expensive chocolates in. So he says, we're going to wrap it in foil. We're going to color it yellow. We're going to, we're going to put a crown on the package. And we're going to call it imperial margarine. Right? So he does all those things, and sure enough, people, once you do all that, they report that they actually quite like margarine. <laughs> and amazingly enough, it tastes just like butter. In fact, it may even taste better than butter. Right? And he does all these incredibly complicated, he puts on all these lunches for like society women, and he, um, he doesn't tell them that it's margarine. And then he asks them after all, what did you think of the, that, that, uh, that, what did you think of that bread that we gave you? Did you like the bread? And they go, I like the bread. Did you like the butter too? They well, thought the butter was excellent. Thank you very much. And so he's like, anyway. So there's all kinds of really, really cool stuff. Um, this concept of sensation transfers is actually incredibly powerful. And I, um, for example, a couple years ago, I don't know if you remember this, Sprite changed the uh, design of their um, cans. And they made the lime on the side of the Sprite can larger. Um, what was this Sprite? Or was it 7-Up? It was Sprite. And then um, immediately after they did that, they were inundated with calls from hardcore Sprite drinkers saying, why did you change the formula of my Sprite? You made it too lemony. And they were like, we didn't change anything. I was like, oh, yes, you did. It's all lemony now. It didn't used to be so lemony. You've ruined my Sprite. And they realized that people saw the lemon on the side, and they were transferring that sensation from the package onto the product. And so they shrunk the lemon back down, and suddenly everyone liked their Sprite again. Um, this is the same reason why. Um, why the girl, on, you know, in the Sun Made Raisin package, there's a girl? Well, I have had long, believe it or not, long discussions with the package consultant for Sun Made Raisins about the size of the breasts on the Sun Made Raisin girl. And the reason is that if you're selling Sun Made Raisins, the way our impressions of the girl on the package shape the way we think the raisin tastes. And you know it's a big issue if you're trying to sell as many good tasting raisins as possible. Just exactly what that impression people are drawing from the sun made raisin girl is. So this guy told me literally he goes to I don't forget who he's a Del Monte I don't know who makes sun made raisins, but he has sat in long meetings where they've got you know PowerPoint and like slides of the girl with this and this and this and like which one do we want and like I mean it gets incredibly complicated. Um, for the same reason. You know when you, if you ever have the misfortune to buy um, Hormel, um, I, did, I can't believe I said that, but you know those Hormel um, uh, cans of uh, whatever, there's a little sprig of parsley between the M and the E, right, on the Hormel package. Do you know why it's there? Because if you have a sprig of parsley there, people will report that the food tastes fresher than if you don't put the sprig of parsley there. So that's why it's there. Anyway, so the point is that when it comes to developing our, our sense of what something tastes like, or our opinion of something, or our, uh, uh, we are making a very, very holistic determination. We're not zeroing in just on the product. We're gathering all kinds of impressions and sensations and, and um, associations from all over the place, and we're mixing them all together in a big jumble, and that's what it means to have an opinion, or to feel that something tastes a certain way, or it's not some narrow thing. It's a very kind of, um, so what this means for Coke and Pepsi is quite simple. That 
The problem with blind taste tests is not just that they're hopelessly biased in favor of the sweet. It's also that the whole concept behind a blind taste test is ridiculous. Why? Because in the real world, no one drinks Coca-Cola blind, right? You drink it out of the can, and you import all of your impressions about the can and the brand name and all of your memories of Coca-Cola and all of the advertising and the fact that you had it when you were six years old and it tasted so great. All of that stuff is factored into the taste. That's the way you experience in the real world. The problem with that blind taste test is it's a completely artificial way of measuring someone's opinion. So let's go to Kenna, because I think this really bears on Kenna. Call-out research is a blind taste test, right? I give you the music in a little snippet, snip of all of the other associations. I don't even tell you what you're listening to, right? I just give it to you cold, and I ask you for your impression. Now, but that's not the way we listen to music. When we listen to music in real life, um, you know, we take a home use test. We're not doing a sip test. We experience the whole thing, and we, you know, we, it's where we're sitting when we hear it. It's the way it sounds coming out of our speakers. It's, you know, there's a great, someone who does call out research told me that whenever they do call out research on uh, new songs by Madonna, they do terribly. But the instant you tell someone it's Madonna, through the roof, right? Classic example. It's the Coke thing all over again. She fails the sip test. She wins the home use test. Because we have all of these kind of very, very positive um, associations with her. So the same thing with Kenna. The people who loved him are the people who experienced Kenna. They listened to him. They saw him. They sat next to him. They went to the Roxy. They, you know, they heard his whole kind of weird spiel. They, you know, they saw this kind of funky little video that he made on MTV too. They got all of these other associations, and they loved him then. But they didn't love him when he was all by himself, stripped of all of, all, you know, when he was, when he was um, just uh, being given to them in a sip. Um, there's another reason to be um, suspicious of the way uh, Kenna was judged. Um, and that has to do with the difference between expert opinion and non-expert opinion. Um, that, is to, that is the difference between asking someone their opinion who knows a subject well enough to be able to explain their opinion and asking someone for their opinion when they don't know the subject very well. Right? A, let me give you another example from the cola business, and I promise this is the last cola-related example I'll give you. Um, there's something called the triangle test in the cola business. Um, and what it is is you fill three glasses. You have three glasses, right? Each of them is covered with a thing. And you say you're, gonna, you're doing a comparison test of Coke and Pepsi. You put Pepsi in one and Coke in the other two, or Pepsi in two and Coke in the other one. So you have you got two and one in some combination. And you give people, you line up the three cans, and you say, I would like you to drink all three and tell me which one is not like the other two. Sounds really, really simple, right? right? Everyone should be able to do that, right? Can't do it. If you do that with 1,000 people, what you'll discover is that the accuracy rate is 33%. It is exactly the same as chance. Now, <laughs> I know that all of you think that you can distinguish Coke from Pepsi normally. And most of us are pretty good at that, although it's harder than you think it is. But and it, it is hard to believe that simply by adding another glass into that equation, I make it impossible for you to distinguish. But it is true. Trust me, I've done this with friends. I actually, <laughs> that tells you something about how long suffering my friends are. But I actually <laughs> had a dinner party where I invited deliberately a number of people who are dedicated cola drinkers. And I had them all do the triangle sip test. And it, actually, I got worse than chance in this room. They were useless at it. <laughs> so now why is, that, why, is that, um, why is that hard? Why should that be so difficult? The answer is that when I give you two glasses and just ask you to distinguish it, you can do it quickly and kind of intuitively. If I give you three, I make you think. And when I make you think about what your preference is, it starts to screw up your preference. And this is a really, really, really important point. There's lots of really interesting psychological work on this. Um, a lot of it has been done by a guy, uh, by two guys, a guy named Tim Wilson at UVA and a guy um, named Jonathan Schooler at Pittsburgh. And Jonathan Schooler actually is, even as we speak, on the other side of town at that conference. Um, uh, they did a famous study about strawberry jam. And what they did is they went to Consumer Reports, did, you know, one of those exhaustive, exhausting Consumer Reports studies of some <laughs> arcane thing. Anyways, Consumer Reports did a massive study of strawberry jam. And they had 44 strawberry jams. And they had a panel of jam experts. And they had them rate all 44 strawberry jams. So what Schooler and Wilson did is they went out and they bought the top-rated strawberry jam, the one that was 11th, 24th, 32nd, 44th. Right? So they get a complete dis dis distribution of this range of strawberry jams. 
and um, uh, and they were the best one was top rated was Knott's Berry Farm, two was Alpha Beta. I've never heard of Alpha Beta. Featherweight was three, Acme four, Sorrel Ridge was five. Then I ask, get a group of college students to come in, and I ask them to do the same thing. We want you to rate these jams, right? The question is, how close are the college students going to be to the experts, right, in ordering these jams? Because they, they're, we're talking about a pretty wide variation in quality here. The experts said that the worst one, Saw Ridge, was like Drek, and the best one, <laughs> Knott's Berry Farm, is really good. Okay, so they bring in the college students. They have them do exactly the same process. And what you find is that college students, people who know nothing about jams, are actually pretty good at ordering the jams the same way the experts do. So we're all pretty good at knowing what's good jam and what's not. Um, and the, um, so for example, the, uh, they have the college students just reverse the order of the top two, which are very close anyway. They have, I think, the, the worst one. They, they also agree that the worst one is worse, and they had the same one at number three. Um, so it's, if you do a correlation, the correlation between the experts and the college students is 0.55, which I don't know how many of you know about correlations, but that's really, really, really good. Um, you rarely get correlations that high in this kind of work. So then Wilson and Schooler do the same experiment over again with a little twist. They have these students come in, and they say, we want you to rank these jams. But this time they say, we want you to tell us why you're ranking the jams the way you're ranking. We want to give, give us your reasons. If you want to put Sorrel Ridge first, tell us why you're putting Sorrel Ridge first. If you want to put Alpha Beta fifth, I want to know why. What makes South Vietnam blue? So these other group, they go all, they write down all their reasons. And what happens? Well, all of a sudden, the college students are not like the experts anymore. They're all over the map. In fact, they've completely screwed it up. Knott's Berry, the far and away the best jam in the bunch, is now the worst jam, or the or second worst jam. They Somehow, if they're forced to think about it, they suddenly turn this great tasting jam into a terrible tasting jam, right? <laughs> Sorrel Ridge, which was the expert's worst jam, which is Drek, now comes in a strong third. These students are convinced, now that they think about it, that Sorrel Ridge is pretty good. Now the correlation between the experts and the students is 0.11 in the world of correlations. That's, that's nothing. That's horrible. That's like, basically what we're saying is there is no correlation between what the experts think and what the students think. So in other words, asking people to think about their choices, to switch them from a kind of unconscious mode to a conscious mode, messes up our decision-making process, right? Um, it makes us reach very, very different decisions than we would have just sort of intuitively. Um, asking someone to think about their opinion, in other words, changes their opinion. Now, this is not true, obviously, for experts. Experts can do this. They can think about um, their opinions and come up with the, the jam experts, if you ask them to rate jam intuitively and think about it first, they'd have the same rankings. That's what it means to be an expert that you know you have access to the kind of world of knowledge about. But that's, but that's not the same, that's not true as well for people who are not experts. Those of us who don't know a field very well, we get screwed up when we have to come to account for the reasons why we like something. I had this hilarious lunch when I was doing this, um, this, uh, uh, this chapter um, with these two women from New Jersey who were professional tasters. They rent themselves out to companies um, to tell them what something tastes like. Um, because you think about it, say you're coming up with a new kind of potato chip, um, you really want to know, does this potato chip taste like Lay's, or does it taste like something that's not even on the potato chip map, right? So who can answer that question? There's no scientific way to do this, so you hire these two women. They come in and they say, well, <laughs> on, you know, they, on, they have 50 different dimensions, and on 47 of these dimensions, it's a lot like Lay's, and they'll tell you precisely on the three dimensions it's not. Anyway, they're inc I mean, imagine having, I took them to a really, really, really fancy restaurant in Manhattan. Imagine having these people, and they have, they're experts on everything, and they're, they've been doing it for 30 years, and they have a whole shtick. But imagine having a really, really, really good lunch with, these, with two very, very funny women who have the most unbelievably developed taste buds about everything. <laughs> Ordering dessert alone took like 25 minutes, and I was in stitches by the end as they had this like long argument with the waiter about the panna cotta. Anyway, that's for another time. <laughs> anyway, they have these guys are these two women are so good. They can actually it's true. They can taste a can of Coke and they can tell you the plant it was bottled in. Right? They can also there's something called rework. I didn't I have no idea what, I had no idea before this what rework is, but rework is where if you're a cookie company, you got two kinds of cookies, and you uh, You've got some leftover ingredients from cookie A. When you take those leftover ingredients and you use them for cookie B, even though it's not precisely the same thing, but it's close enough, they can tell rework. They'll say, they'll take a, it tastes like a wheat thin, and they'll say, 
what were they thinking? What? <laughs> How could, you know, they have those, imagine, so much fun. The, um, <laughs> they, uh, they did this whole thing on, um, on why you, they explained to me why, uh, why you, we don't like store-bought cola. Why doesn't store-bought cola work? Well, the whole thing, <laughs> this is a side, but it's worth it. Um, the thing that makes Pepsi and Coke really, really genius is they've managed to do something that's incredibly hard to do, which is all the different flavors of Coke and Pepsi, there's like, you know, I don't know how many, six, seven dominant flavors. They are perfectly in balance in Coke and Pepsi. It's an incredibly smooth experience. Nothing, as they say, spikes. Spiking is bad in the beverage business. When you drink be those beverages, it's all, you know, the cinnamon, the, the, the vanilla, the this, the sugar, the lime. It's all in one little smooth thing. Store brands can't do that. They're not smart enough. They're not paying enough money for it. They're buying it cheap. So what happens is certain tastes spike, and that's what you're getting in a store brand. So in particular, the things that spike in store-bought cola are citrus um, and uh, cinnamon. Um, like I said, the, one of these women said that when you drink a store-bought cola, it's like, it's like there's this big, fat hunk of cinnamon sitting in the bottom of the bottle. Right? <laughs> now, you and I can drink store-bought cola, and when we drink it, we know it doesn't taste as good as Coke, but we don't know why. We have a kind of vague impression. We can't put our finger on it. Why? Because we don't have the training, but more important, we don't have the vocabulary. What these women have is the vocabulary. They can break down, you know, there are 12 different kinds of vanilla, and they know all 12 kinds. There are, you know, you know there is vanilla-ine, vanilla raisiny prune, caramelized, whiny, tobacco. That's just vanilla, right? Then you can go into citrus, and oh my god, there's all more categories for citrus. There's distilled lemon, and there's expressed lemon, and there's you know, blah, blah, blah. Candy like lemon, you know, goes on and on. The point is then that that's why they're so, that's why they aren't thrown off by having to explain their um, opinion, because they have the vocabulary to explain it, and they can very, very precisely say what something is. We can't do that, right? So that's sort of, I think, what's going on with, with, um, with Kenna, that the experts, when they're asked, why do you think this guy's so good? They can say, well, I think he's X, Y, and Z. And, but for the non-expert, for the people who just sort of randomly chosen in the, in the call-out research, when they are confronted with this battery of questions, they don't have the vocabulary to be able to answer those questions in a way that, is in, uh, that is, uh, conforms with their actual opinion. Now, I think this is a really critical point, so I'm going to go into it in a little more detail. I'm also going to have a little bit of water. Um, by the way, I was, as I drank this water, having all kinds of sensation transference <laughs> from a particular can. But um, it isn't just that thinking about our preferences changes our preference. Is that thinking about <laughs> thinking about our preferences changes them in a very, very specific and interesting way. Wilson and School, those two psychologists, they did an, this is another another um, experiment that shows this really beautifully. They um, they used posters, they had a big room full of posters. And they brought these students in and they said, pick any poster you like, take it home. It's yours, right? So they did. Students did. Then they brought another group in and they said, pick any um, uh, poster you like. But before you take it home, we'd like you to tell you, tell us why you like the poster you picked, right? Okay, so sure enough, what he found was that the, the um, uh, so in other words, oh, wait a second. Um, Yes, and what he found was, just like in the jam case, when you ask someone to give reasons why, your choices change. The kids asked to explain why they were doing, pick different posters. But listen to the posters they picked. The people who walked in and could just take anything without explanation, overwhelmingly chose sort of impressionistic, there are a lot of, of, of um, posters of impressionist painters. For example, Monet's water lilies. A lot of them took Monet's water lilies. People who were asked to give a reason for their choices, gravitated away from the Impressionist posters and towards a lot of these sort of cute posters. So a lot of them, you know those posters that have like a kitten that's hanging from a bar and it says, hang in there, baby? You know, seen those? <laughs> they were much more likely to take the cute one of the kitten than they were of, the, of Monet. Then, second thing that happens is that several weeks later, Wilson and Scooter call up students and they say, you know, we got your poster for free a couple weeks ago. Do you like your poster? The ones who picked Monet's water lilies say, I love my poster. The ones who took the cute kitten were like, no, what was I thinking? I, you know, I threw it. <laughs> now, so why does that happen? Well, it goes back to this language issue, right? You know, you may like a poster or some jam on a kind of gut level, um, but since you don't know 
really why. You can't, don't have the language available to kind of capture that properly. When I ask you to come up with an explanation, you just make an explanation up. You pick the first thing, plausible thing that comes into your head, right? What do you think of the texture of the jam? I know nothing about the texture of jams. If you ask me about that, I'll just say, I don't know. I guess I thought it was a, that one seemed a little bit uh, bristly. So I, you know, so I've decided now that, you know, Knott's Berry Farm is a little bristly. And I've, you know, now we've planted this idea of bristly in my head now. So now when you say, well, you know, you know, actually, I kind of like Knott's Berry, but now that I think about it, it is bristly, and bristly is not a good thing. And so I'm going to, I start knocking Knott's Berry down from number one to number three to number four. And, you know, we make up these reasons, and then we sort of get attached to these reasons, even though these reasons may have nothing whatsoever to do with the way we feel. Um, so what you're doing then when you ask people to introspect about their decisions is you are not just changing their choices, but you're changing their choices towards things that are easily justified, right? The choice, you're favoring the choice for which really, really plausible reasons come easily to mind. People intuitively prefer water lilies, right? But when they account for their, have to account for their decision, they choose cute kittens. Why? Because it's really easy to explain why you like the cute kitten. I had a cat when I was young. I, Love cats. Uh, I think the cat there looks really cute. You know, blah, blah, blah. water lilies. How do you? It's a lot harder to come up with a kind of plausible um, explanation. So what you're doing with introspection is you are forcing people away from complexity, and you're forcing them towards simplicity. So I think this is sort of what's happening to Ken as well, right? Ken is not easy. He's not the cat. He's the water lily. He's a little bit harder. You don't know. You can't place him. He's not modern. He's not quite new wave. He's not rap. He's a black guy, but he's from Africa. It's, you know, he doesn't fall into a kind of classic category. So when people are forced to explain why they like this music, all of a sudden they run out of language. They really can't come up with a reason. So what do they do? Well, it's a lot easier for them to say, that I like the new Britney Spears album, because they can put Britney Spears into a, into a nice, you know, understandable category. This is a, you know, I think Hollywood has this problem all the time. Um, and this is one of the explanations for why for this complaint we all have that so many Hollywood movies are the same and are so bland and are so conservative. They're just like the last one, right? Well, because they're doing this very, very elaborate test screening and they're asking people to justify, did you or did you not like the movie you just saw and why, right? And when you ask people to do that, they will start to give you very, very conservative answers. I talked to lots of directors of, um, in Hollywood who told me that one of the most common things is uh, you'll have a comedy and you'll screen a comedy for an audience and they'll laugh uproariously. And afterwards, you'll say, what did you think of that movie? And they'll say, nah, I didn't think it was that, I didn't think it was that funny. Right? And I said, well, which do you believe? And they said, well, we, we have to believe what they said. We don't have to believe what they said. That's why movies aren't funny. Um, anyway, I think this is insane, clearly. Let me try one more idea out on you um, to explain this phenomenon. Because I've, oh my, I didn't realize I've been talking this long. Um, and that is about. Um, uh, uh, it's this story about the air on chair. And I don't know how many of you know about air on chairs. Um, air on chairs are those, they're made out of mesh, that weird shape. They're black and they have a kind of, the back is wider. They're incredibly ergonomically designed. They're the hip chair that in the last couple of years, if you worked in Silicon Valley in 1999, you didn't have an air on chair, that you felt like you were a kind of social outcast, a loser. They're like the cool chair. And if you look in TV ads for like, cool people, they're always sitting in an air on chair. I noticed that some of the people um, upstairs at this institute have air on chairs. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so the air on chair is made by Herman Miller. And they started working on it in the early 90s. And chairs, when you market research them, are judged on two dimensions. Aesthetics, comfort. Simple scale of 1 to 10. And the rule is, if you want to take a chair to market, you've got to get above seven on both those levels. Right? It's got to be beautiful. It's got to be. So they make these early versions of the air on chair in the early 90s. And they go take it out, and they test it on people. And the comfort scores are great. Sevens, eights, fantastic. In fact, some of the comfort scores are higher than they've ever gotten on comfort before. But the bad news is the aesthetic scores are terrible. People think this chair is hideous. Right? And they say so. I've looked at the reports from the focus groups, and people are saying it looks like something out of a bad movie. It looks like something that you got out of a junkyard shop. It looks like something RoboCop would sit in. I mean, there's all these kinds of people hate it. And the scores that are coming in are twos and threes. Now, you cannot, what people are saying is, as comfortable as it is, it's hideous, and I won't buy it for my, you know, you can't sell a chair that people think is really, really ugly. Um, so this is a very, very similar um, 
uh, dilemma to the ones that people have over Kenna. Um, only this time, the stakes are way bigger. Herman Miller is, you know, they have factories that they're tooling up at a cost of tens of millions of dollars, and they've got a mark, you know, they have spent years and millions of dollars developing this chair. Their investment at this point is enormous. And yet they are hearing from the people who are supposed to buy the chairs. And by the way, people who hated it the most are, were facility managers, people who buy chairs. Um, they hated it. So they're hearing from their customers that they think this is a monstrosity, right? Huge dilemma. So what do they do? Well, they go ahead. They're not a normal company. They're like kind of wacky and they take chances all the time. And um, you know, many other companies would have shelved the project. So they go ahead and they disregarded what the people said they thought about this chair. And they brought it to market, you know, just the way they normally would. And so what happens? Well, in the beginning, not much. Pretty slow at the beginning. And then a couple of like designer types start to pick it up. And then it kind of spreads. And then it goes to Silicon Valley. And people realize it really, really is comfortable. And goes up, starts to win some design awards. And up and up and up and up. And then after it comes kind of a cult chair, and the sales are starting to rise and rise and rise. So it's getting TV commercials. Sure enough, by the end of the 1990s, their sales are increasing 50 to 70% annually. And by a couple of years ago, they realized that they have on their hands not only the biggest selling product in their history, but one of the top selling chairs in the history of chairs. Right? <laughs> this thing. And then they go back, and they go out, and they, they redo their focus groups. right? And they go out to people, and they say, this is after the chair is a huge hit. And they say, what do you think of this chair as, as a, you know, on an aesthetic scale of 1 to 10? And people say, I think it's an 8. It's gorgeous. <laughs> so what does this mean? Does this mean that we can never trust what people have to say? Um, no, I mean, there are some things that some chairs truly are ugly, and there is some music that really is terrible, and there, are some, there is some jam that tastes awful. Um, you know, that doesn't mean that we, can't, we can never trust what people say, but I think there is a class of products, ideas, um, what have you, chairs, music, um, that falls into a different category. That sometimes when people are reacting to things that are very, very new and very, very different, they say they don't like it, but what they really mean to say is, I don't have the language to describe it, and I haven't come to grips with the fact that it's a little different than I'm used to. Right? So what the problem with market research is, is that it ends up lumping together things that are radically new in a good way and radically new in a bad way. And that is a real shame, because those, that's the last thing we want to do, is to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Um, well, I think this is Kenneth's problem, right? I mean, I think that um, his music was unusual. People hadn't heard it before, and they didn't know what, quite what to do with it. And it's going to take a little longer for them to get used to it. But that is not an argument for not playing on the radio. That is an argument for playing on the radio, because that's what really listening to the radio is supposed to be all about, right? Is to discover new things and to have your mind um, expanded. But I think we're making this mistake over and over again um, in our world, is that we're using these very, very narrow instruments. And what they are doing is that they are chasing away good ideas that have the misfortune of merely being different, radically different in some way than what we're used to. Um, and it's shaping what we get. I mean, as a result, we have a world which I think is a little more conservative, a little more narrow, a little less adventurous and ambitious, um, a little more imaginative than it would be otherwise. Um, we're cheating ourselves of um, the true kind of fruits of human endeavor. Um, and I think that's a real shame. Anyway, thank you. Thank you.